So I just really, with this presentation, rather than a paper, but maybe it'll go that way, um, want to share some materials, firstly still, and then moving images that can potentially articulate structure as an arrangement of relations that primarily attends to and cares for, um, in essence, that which supports. Um, in particular, I'll focus on the, how the category of the technical support is inscribed onto the production stills of industrial cinema on the one hand, which is the first part of the talk, and in a different register onto the frames of moving images produced by artists such as Joyce Wheeland, Beatrice Santiago, Munoz, and, and a couple of others, depending on time. So, unlike most of you here, my work is not located in academic discourse, um, but rather within this space of support. So as a producer of moving image and performance, it resides in the transitional space between an idea and its manifestation. And as a curator, my work resides in, the, in a different transitional space, um, that which an artwork passes through from the studio to kind of the mo mo moment of encounter with the public. Um, which is to say, although my training is far from that of a theorist, I do still want to discuss a certain understanding of structure that is bound up in moving image practice, and one that can maybe swerve the reductionism of some sort of apparatus theory. Um, so, we're going to move in approximately 40 year jumps um, from um, the militarized landscapes of industrial cinema of the 1930s to that again of the 1970s. Um, films that seek to image the event, so to speak, um, which in turn coincides in the 1970s with this sort of moment of structural or to be more precise materials, materialist filmmaking practice in New York and London. And then jump ahead to, to now to a, con a current post-military landscape as imaged by artist Beatrice Santiago Munoz, um, which we could call after image, I suppose. So, I will show the first slide. <laughs> uh, the color's not great, but you get the idea. Um, so, I want to start with a quote from cinematographer Hal Moyer, which frames a desire for the invisibility of the technical as the key professional aim in commercial film production that still persists in order to privilege the illusion. He's a kind of early cinematographer of the early 20th century. So, quote, I think photography is beautiful only insofar as it is absorbed within the production. And I think that a cameraman should be versatile enough to conform to whatever the story would be. So this first section, is framed by these two production shots, um, one from the set of Frank Capra's North Pole aerial action adventure, Dirigible, which was released in 1931, whose principal filming was shot not in the Arctic, but um, on a US Navy lot in New Jersey. And the other um, brilliant image, uh, which is a dolly shot on set in the Philippines uh, during the filming of the Vietnam War epic Apocalypse Now, released in 1979, and obviously a movie whose production was so notoriously hard on the cast and crew that even Francis Ford Coppola is said to have threatened suicide. So in the first image, the cam cameras are swaddled in blankets as the, leader, as the lead actor sits smothered in furs amongst the suited crew. In the second, the camera and crew are almost naked, in motion and cloaked in a livid smog. So in juxtaposition, these photographs stage a dynamic shift between the labor of technical support and the apparatus of image capture. So in first person accounts and anecdotal interviews with many of the production crews of the early 20th century, um, a recurring image is, is conjured, that of cameras swaddled in blankets. So like looking at this first image. So blankets that would weave the McCormick harvester sounds of a camera's mechanism. Blankets whose fabrics allowed, allowed sound to permeate. Blankets to, project, pr to protect from static or cold or from Thomas Edison's detectives. Blankets draped behind the camera to shield Sir Shirley Temple's eyes from the potential of clear eye, which was caused by these 1,000 foot arc candles, uh, the arc lights um, necessary for the early um, production of Technicolor films. And then there was this crucial blanket, which was thrown by Al Richard, who was cinematographer Fred J. Balshaver's heavy, kind of like big, kind of bouncer guy, who was employed to protect the unsanctioned camera they were using from patent detectives, using the production of The True Heart of an Indian from um, 1909. Um, but instead of, instead of using it to kind of protect the camera, what he did was use it to save it from this like belching smoke of an uncontrolled cabin fire that the overzealous production designer had set so that he could get desired smoke effects. Well, back to that. So um, just this little quote down here, which is from Frank, Frank Capra, kind of like, I guess, in relation to this, um, to this image, which is blankets on cameras to keep them quiet, not warm. So I first came across this image of Frank Capra's cloaked cameras when it was included in the popular American film critic Leonard Moulton's Behind the Camera. 
Here's is just one of a number of references by similar cinematographers and camera operators to the blankets used to cushion, hide, quiet and care for photographic equipment in the early days of film production. In the move to talkies in the late 1920s, the blanket finds a new use, shifting from protection and care of the camera to its deployment in hopes of mechanical silence. So by 1935, the so-called Silent Camera Committee of the, Acam of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences were perfecting their blimps by making them quieter and lighter weight. So Capra's desire for a hushed camera is an actual stark contrast to these other accounts, which is um, of Balshafer, the, the cinematographer I mentioned earlier, from previous decades. So in many interviews, he traces this kind of like, what he describes as sort of like a loving history of early blanket companies, which is, I'm not sure if it's a frame, framework that he just made up or if it's kind of a thing. But um, so what he describes them as is early film production teams who shot mostly in the then wilds of New Jersey, which of course is where a lot of American film production started out. Um, which was crewed by engineers who prote protected their productions from the patent snitches and private detectives of the Motion Picture Patents Company. Now, this MPPC was set up in 1908, so one year just before the, the fire in the, um, in the film I described earlier, as a trust comprised of the major ma motion picture studios who had collectively licensed Thomas Edison's multiple patented camera mechanisms. So, the technicians and artists of independent companies excluded from this membership transported and filmed their one or two reelers with blankets draped around them as not just protection but also camouflage. So the detectives were sent out to, to seek and prosecute any infringement on the Edison patent um, and so like that's actually described as quote rights to the intermittency of the camera and any device that pulled down film and allowed a slack loop space for the film to be carried down before the next pull down while the exposure was being made. So this particular mechanism provided the key for efficiently photographing usable moving images with the few, fewest jams and losses. So although there were a lot of different types of camera, this was kind of like the one that worked. Um, so many of the cameras already in the US, of course, in, uh, already in circulation, infringed on this patent. So when the government upheld Edison's legal claim, independent producers were legally barred from shooting with the tool that they already owned. Um, the consequences of which were far from minor, um, as the attempt by independents to dodge this price trap led in part to the move of production westward, not yet to Hollywood, but to the rural peace and potential of the landscape light and year-round possibilities of the American West, um, which of course is now exemplary of what we understand as early um, cinematic production. So Balshafer's protege, another cinematographer, Arthur Miller, and his cohort took the blanket further. When filming during winter on the East Coast, he stitched pockets into felt blankets to hold hot water bottles tightly against the cartridges to prevent static, and he stretched gauze across the lens when he needed to create DIY soft focus. The fabric therefore augmented the camera, a protective layer that added to its portability and durability. This was crucially important and to, to the increasingly frequent experiments with mobile shots and ghost rides in which the crews would fix the camera to trains, automobiles, wheelchairs, whatever, anything that moved. So as early as a picture from 1911, rather than having the actors move theatrically towards the camera, um, Miller actually un literally untethered it from the, from the floor where it was usually screwed down. And this, in essence, shifted the relationship between the action we see in frame and the apparatus that frames it. So this kind of like major shift that we probably all understand. Um, so in moving the camera, Miller and his peers around the world created a new filmic language that shifted from the previously fixed lens to a mobile point of view that was part of the action. Um, and this shift is hardly linear, though as 20, 20 years later in this, make it big, dirigible production shot, the camera is stationary and the set sedate as synced sound scenes required cumbersome architecture of ice boxes to soundproof the camera. So this ice box was about six feet square with a window of optical glass and the operator and assistant would have to be inside, often described as dying for lack of oxygen and heat. So in the context of film, a film discourse that fixates in the 1920s as a decade of camera mobility, as also dirigibles and these kind of like very crazy action, like um, aerial, aerial scenes attest to, this particular photograph marks a brief pause that was brought about by the introduction of dialogue, a pause that remained necessary until sophisticated blimps were designed for both sound and a deliberately embodied camera with the potential to revel in its technical capabilities and the human expertise behind it. So it was a unique pause, but one quickly outmoded by the fact that cameras became much more durable and inexpensive. 
Um, as a cameraman of the early days of this, Miller, however, remained entirely indifferent. Um, in 1932, he's bouncing the camera on his rubber tire and me and my gal to simulate crashing through a ceiling. Okay. So, <laughs> in 1976, on the set of Apocalypse Now, the camera's blanket has been reduced to an insulated cover to protect the film stock. A drifting plume of bright yellow smoke blurs and joins the energetic crew and the onset action. Here, a different sort of camouflage, not a blanket, but smoke marks out the space between lens and actor. The smoke effects envisioned by cinematographer Vittorio Storaro, Vittorio Storaro sorry, are invoked in the service of wartime realism, of course, but also because the atmospheric wisps add a visible image of motion to the shot, distinct from the movement created by, by the camera being pushed along by the dolly. So the development of operator controlled camera motion as opposed to the technique of fixing the tripod camera on a dolly or for that matter a train uh, brought new possibilities for what would be understood as a subjective camera. So the impulse, impulse towards such camera um, motion was not new, obviously Vertov's Kinoglas um, manifesto from 1922 for example theorized a form of camera sight that was inseparable from its operator. Moreover, if the handheld verite of Europe's new wave and the free for cinema of the 1950s and 1960s drew explicit influence from Vertov, it also came in the wake of, um, of the ashes of the World War II, of shooting um, what was, became known as rubble noir. In those films, the camera mirrored the movements of its operator, who was then figured in as like a character in the film. This technique drifted into non-war films such as the intensely subjective camera of Robert Montgomery's Lady in the Lake from 1947. I don't know if any of you have seen that. It's a terrible film, but it's kind of amazing for about five minutes. Um, so it's filmed entirely with a mobile camera providing, providing the POV of the hard-boiled detective Marlowe. It projected the technology itself as a star. And there's these brilliant accounts of like how many technicians it took to light a cigarette pretending to be a person with the camera. So, by the 1970s and on the, sec um, on the set of Apocalypse Now, everyone was in motion. In the midst of Sorraro's, quote, visual language of smoke and light, of languid tracking shots and handheld jitteriness, a new phase of camera motion was emerging. In the midst of pre-production, Sorraro tried out cinematographer and inventor Garrett Brown's new Steadicam, which was commercially launched actually in the same year, but hadn't quite come out at that point. So Storaro had long utilized a handheld camera as, quote, an expression of myself, a signature, so to speak. And while he didn't use Steadicam for Apocalypse Now, he understood the crucial shift engendered and in the future would delegate most of his mobile shots to a Steadicam operator. But even though he relied on traditional techniques of track and dolly and handheld in this particular film, I'd suggest that its presence haunts the film all the same, or more precisely, marks the production still and the film beyond it. So the Steadicam brought, a, brought the camera directly to the body for the first time. So I don't know if any of you have used a Steadicam, been around a Steadicam. So it has a gyroscopic arm that is attached to you know, a tight supportive vest, which suspends the camera in the air free from the shakiness of the human hand so you can let it go. Um, it generates that now wholly familiar lingering drift as the operator's body is once present and erased. Um, so for me, the crucial motion of the Steadicam as a combination of lens, rig, and body um, lies in this interval or delay between the moving body and the moving camera. So here the operator is always engaged in this sort of three-step process, propulsion, momentum, and anticipation for kind of the turn. Um, with a heavy rig, the operator propels the camera in the direction of the shot before it gains momentum and overtakes the operator's direction entirely. At this point, there's this like floating pause is all I can really describe it as while well, the operator kind of like strains to smoothly bring the camera back around to a new angle. Um, it's, it's a drift that shifts from operator in control to camera in control to back again in a literal exchange of weight and velocity between body and apparatus. Um, in this suspension we might feel and discern the camera's momentarily weightless path through the air and with it the connective tissue between the machine and operator. So nonetheless, as we see in the energetic propulsion of the dolly um, by the two grips in this Apocalypse Now production shot, it would be a mystification to treat this as a dynamic that only emerges with the Steadicam. Garrett Brown's rig indeed gave a certain physical clarity to the exchange between camera and operator, but this interplay was already present in earlier camera motion technique. 
So how then does the Steadicam provide a distinct entry into this history of smoke and blankets? Or in other words, the specificity, the specifically technical support structures of cinema. So what it does, or at least what I would say it does, is it transforms the blanket from, an, from a ready-made apparatus for protecting the camera into the rig's custom-designed protective vest. The camera shifts from being a distinct object to, being, to be held and handled to being literally bound to the body. Meanwhile, the smoke further supports this effect of this exchange by filling and animating the air around the operator the result of these atmospheric effects is that they both connect the space between the camera and the scene and make immediately visible any motion of that camera, drawing the audience further into the action. So it's worth remembering at this point Hal Moyer's words on the invisibility of those whose job is situated in support of production. Um, and it's reiterated again in different words by um, Miller, quote, my opinion of a well photographed film is one where you look at it and come out and forget that you've looked at a moving picture. You forget that you've seen any photography, then you've succeeded. Quote. So that success has been repeatedly achieved beyond what Miller might have imagined. Too often we fail to pay adequate attention to the conditions of production that are not just operative in, but central to the making of these works. Counter to this, we should ask, what would it mean to tell the history of cinema, not just as a technical history, but as a history of technical support? So one approach might be to peer under the blanket during the, these first years of cinematic production by reading not just the films, but the numerous images of industrial film production. So through these stills that um, there are archives and archives of, we can potentially clarify the complex dynamics between the camera and its operators. It would be false to claim, of course, any easy narrative arc between that of the camera and, uh, bet sorry, that starts with the figure of the blanket, which takes care of the camera as if it's something fragile or childlike, and, reaching the co and reaches the co-mingling of the human and technical in the Steadicam's mutual support of camera and operator. However, each new technological development in the capture of images drives not only aesthetic transformations, but also transformations in the relationship between the technicians and the technology, and then, of course, the, the subject itself. So obviously the camera no longer needs an Al Richard to blanket it from smoke, nor an operator to shed the heat inside the icebox. Um, Hollywood productions can now remotely control camera drones with barely a second thought to patent detectives, must less fear the irreplaceability of the occasional drone that might crash its high definition payload into a canyon wall, an actual anecdote relayed to me by a cameraman I just worked with from his last Hollywood film. Uh, still, I'd argue that if we begin with these symbiotic systems, of technical support, even only in terms of making sense of film style or genre, we could attend to and isolate connective and unseen moments that trace a sort of alternative or alternate film history, one that reveals how images are not only bound to the technologies of capture or the singular vision of the artist auteur. So rather, by close reading the whole production process through photographs such as these, we can see how cinema is explicitly framed and implicitly transformed by the way the equipment is handled, fixed, subverted, hidden, retrofitted, and cared for by the artists, technicians, and engineers whose work it is to operate them. So moving a giant shift towards artist film video. Um, so one artist filmmaker whose films in the 1970s obviously articulate this transformation pretty directly is Morgan Fisher. Um, I don't know how many of you seen, have seen production stills. You can only watch on 60 millimeter. So I'm just gonna show you. There you go, you kind of get the idea. Um, so this image or these images is our stills from Fisher's 1970 film production stills. It's actually an 11 minute single shot in which a series of Polaroid production stills that you see here are pinned to the wall one after the other in front of the camera lens. So each photograph shows the camera and its operator and the placing of the images on the wall in real time as the camera is rolling. So is this kind of like obvious delay in what has been imaged by the Polaroid by the time we see it on the film. So sync sound captures the voices of those making this film in the studio as they work. Um, Fisher's work is usually and logically lumped together with those of his American structural film peers. And although this is not wrong, particularly in terms of his adherence to the rules of structural film, identified by P. Adam Sidney through his naming of this film style, for example, production stills uses a fixed camera and a straight take of one roll of um, 400 foot 16 millimeter film, which is exactly 11 minutes. And so when you look at experimental film, everything's 11 minutes long. 
a little tedious. Um, so, however, for me, Fisher's film moves past this reductionist modernism of this group in order to reveal what happens behind the camera and out of frame in the interaction between apparatus, operator, director, sound record, recordist, production assistant, etc. So by foregrounding the activity of those involved in the film's making as subject, he attends directly to the technical, not only to the apparatus, which would be kind of like an apparatus theory version of things, but to those whose profession requires them to remain invisible. So to be clear, Structural Film, as it was named by Sydney, referred to the activities of the filmmakers at the New York Filmmakers Co-op in the 1960s and into the early 1970s, marked by a rejection of what they understood as the Hollywood adherence to illusion. They focused on producing films whose form and content was faithful to the production and presentation of film itself. This ranged from the process of um, photographic reproduction all the way to the apparatus of projection. Of course, Sydney's use of the term structural is confusing insofar as, um, as although there may be certain conceptual crossovers in terms of potential linguistic concerns in particular films, I mean, Evan and I were talking earlier, maybe Michael Snow, um, um, it's important to mark structural film out from the entire separate path of structuralist film, or like the discourse around structuralist film. Um, and actually, someone that did this really well in the 70s as a kind of like a rebuff, as someone that made structural film, Peter Goodall, um, who was a London filmmaker um, from the London Filmmakers Co-op, who kind of like came to this style, I don't know if you call it a style, a little bit later. Um, and he, he, so he renamed it Structural Materialist Film, and he's written a lot of essays about it, but I'm gonna quote a little bit to give you the idea. So quote, this is Peter Goodall. Structural slash materialist film, attempts to be non-illusionist. The process of the film's making deals with devices that result in demystification or attempted demystification of the film process. The structuring aspects and the attempt to decipher the structure and anticipate, recorrect it, to clarify and analyze the production process of the specific image at any specific moment are the root concern of structural materialist film. The specific construct of each specific film is not the relevant point. One must beware not to let the construct, the shape, take the place of the story in narrative film. Then one would merely be substituting one hierarchy for another within the same system of formalism for what is traditionally called content. So although Goodell had non-hierarchical aims, and he's a truly brilliant filmmaker, still is, um, the act of articulating the process of production in these films came with a strict set of reductionist rules that essentially denied the use of a range of tools of image capture that were widely being used in not only industrial cinema at the time, but of course many other different experimental film practices. So in particular, and at the same time that the Steadicam was being developed by Garrett Brown, the handheld camera as one that you can deliberately read as handheld on screen almost disappeared briefly from within these co-op circles, as was a technology that was primarily seen as supporting and furthering the illusion of cinema. Sorry. Stop speaking for a second. So a couple of years later, in 1973, New York filmmaker co-op um, filmmaker Joyce Whelan, his film Solidarity, which I'm sure many of you know. How many people have actually seen Solidarity, by the way? Oh, great. <coughs> Good. Um, reconnected the operator's hand to the camera in order to articulate Solidarity through the film itself. The technical support imaged in this binding is made explicit by the film's framing and motion. So in Solidarity, which we'll watch in a second, we hear rather than see the protests of Ontario's dare cookie factory workers. And we hear it as a full family affair. Men's, women's, and children's voices form a textured soundscape as the camera resolutely fixes on the demonstrator's tired feet. They shift weight onto one heel, there we go, onto one heel and then another, and, they, and the camera holds steady, and as, as it does so, it sort, of, it sort of, in essence, brings out this monotony of the picket. It deliberately camouflages the spectacular banner-waving images of political or militant cinema at the time, and it leaves the voices to do the political work. So I'm gonna, let's watch this, actually. It's 11 minutes. <laughs>
the majority of whom are women, were forced to accept wages and working conditions which would be a disgrace in any community. We are here to begin the movement that will put an end to such exploitation. We are here to fight against the inhuman exploitation of women which has been a specialty of the Bayer Company. We are here to stop the sweat breakers, the vile fools of big bosses and their government which allow their ugly practices. We are here to demonstrate that the labor movement and progressive Canadians can be more powerful than the court, their injunctions, their police forces, and all their organs of oppression and working people. your password for your computer. Yes, <laughs> Thanks. Okay. 
Um, I was gonna show some more films in a second. Okay, so I mean, there's a lot to say about that, but it's perhaps a gendered camera that bothers to look at such things in the first place. To be concerned for bodies, not just minds and politics, and to listen to, white, to what might otherwise be unheard. So of course, situating her work in the context of early 1970s feminist discourse, it makes sense, to all, a sense that it is also the fundamental and permanent labor except, expected of a housewife, to take care and to be attuned to damage. Thus, we simply hear the collective in the familiar, familiar chanting of union songs before the microphone squeal marks the time for quiet concentration as the women's representative urges support for the strike. The impulse response of Whelan's field recordings produces a sonic affect that transports us into the crowd. It catches the loudspeaker's hiss and squeal and demands our attention, calls for silence to let a single woman's voice be heard as the reverb from the loudspeakers situates us in the open air. Rather than dramatic shots of the crowd, a static solidarity printed across each frame provides the primary point of entry through which to read the film. It acts, in a way, like Balshafer or Miller's blanket, in fact, a quietly defiant declaration of resistance. As in Fisher's production still, solidarity privileges the sound and image tracks equally. For Whelan, however, solidarity marks, marks the move towards a more direct, postmodern approach to political filmmaking than the structural films that she made in New York during the 1960s, a time in which she described being marginalized by the predominantly male avant-garde filmmakers such as her then husband, Michael Snow, as the, although the film, and although the film adheres to multiple structural materialist techniques, like again, the Fisher is 11 minutes long, is kind of a joke, I think, because obviously it has edits, it's not like a single take, um, a gesture again, perhaps towards the um, structural economy of a single roll of 16 millimeter. She revives the, a concept of camouflage through which what is deliberately left off screen, a figurative blanket, draped around the shoulders of those who are unimaged. So now I want to create a little interlude um, and show two short videos that um, maybe we'll talk about after because we're not going to have a ton of time. Um, the first one I want to show, it's by um, Arthur Jaffer, um, whose films are getting a lot of traction just now, but um, he's been making films. He's also a cinematographer um, for a long time in America. Um, this is called Yellow Jacket. It's about a minute and a half long from 2001. And for me, it's really, um, kind of a, an accompanying film to Solidarity. And the second is actually not a film, it's um, uh, like a minute and a half of a performance by Andros Zins Brown, who's um, an American choreographer, who made this work Atlas Revisited last year with visual artist uh, Karthik Pandian. And um, I think the thing that's like striking about it is it's like a very precise moment in the performance where Andros describes both through his voice and the articulation of his own body, the relationship between operator, camera, and subject. And he plays all of those things in order to re-articulate the relationship between observer and observed at play in the infamous, infamous image of self-immolation that sparked the Arab Spring. Um, I'm a little worried that you're not going to be able to see the first part of Andros's, but um, it's it's very dark, and then it sort of comes into a close-up. But basically, he's he sort of places himself as he's like framing the landscape, and he's as he's talking. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear him talk. So he's actually kind of like moving the camera and his gestures with it, and then you'll catch some. I think that I've presented. Oh, well, maybe that's not. Maybe it's Arthur's first. We'll see. Yeah. So this is AJ's yellow jacket.
it, so we can talk about that a little bit more afterwards, but I'll just move to Andros. In this image, you see a row of apartment buildings. Sorry, I have to wait a minute. Behind them, a range of mountains. Several of them capped with snow. It's like, <laughs> the sky is gray and cloudy. In the distance, we hear shouts, cheers, pulsing. Sounds of cars, car horns, sirens. The image pans down into the right to reveal the courtyard. And across the bottom right hand corner, the rail of the balcony. Goes shaky for a moment, but then settles towards the back of the courtyard. And in the center of the frame, we see several black pixels. Camera stays focused on them for several moments. And we hear a loud sound. Shouts approach now from behind the frame. On the right side of the picture, a leg. Shaking. On the left side, the pool of blood rolls into the image. And the picture goes black. Okay, so finally, um, I want to end back at a military site with two films produced in 2014 by artist Beatrice Santiago Munoz at a former coastal US naval station in Ciba, Puerto Rico. Um, they're related in terms of time and location, but were produced using very different techniques. So like, um, I'm gonna just give it this image, like Solidarity, Munoz's films utilize motion in order to reframe objects, places, histories, and people that might otherwise remain off screen and also, of course, um, AJ. But unlike Whelan's attention to bodies, the first of these, these films, post-military cinema, that we'll watch now, attends to the care of an abandoned building and to the other uses it is now put towards by those not authorized to use it, namely a hive of bees and encroaching vegetation. Munoz's films, films the architecture in such a way as to be recognized through our universal experience of cinema in a move not dissimilar to the structural materialist investigation of the apparatus of projection in expanded cinema practice. In this post-military cinema, in this post-military cinema, sunlight is the projector beam that is animated and obscured by vegetation fluttering in the breeze to project images into thickly crumbling architecture. So outside in. In other shots, open doors or spider webs become projection screens. Again, we'll, we will revisit the smoke effect as an apocalypse now. It drifts in plumes towards the surrounding trees while the bees buzz like helicopters. However, here the smoke is shown to be produced on screen and by hand in order to rid the building of said bees that are the new but benign generation of colonizers. Let's watch the first one. So this again is gonna be very dark, I'm sorry.
Okay. Um, so I've already done an hour, so I'm going to shorten this a little bit. Um, I'll just show one more film. Um, her next work, actually, this kind of accompanying work. Um, so I don't know if I made clear that was actually an ex cinema. It was like the kind of like military bases cinema. So her other work, Other Uses, um, which is much brighter, uh, you'll be able to see it much better, um, is filmed through, she actually films these through mirrored sculptures that she makes also as an artist and kind of presents as well. They're things that she has named Malioscopios, um, as she describes them. Um, and so Other Uses projects shifting unstable viewpoints as kind of multiple prismatic images are arrayed in a single image, which you'll see. Together, these refracted shards of ghostly architecture, land, sea, and the fishermen who work on it, produces a composite timescale that gestures not only to the region's colonial past, but also to the continued militarized present. Other uses conceives a cinema that reaches into the long history of image making, from early Renaissance experiments with perspective using lenses, mirrors, and kaleidoscopes to the structural films of 1960s and 70s New York and London filmmakers co-ops. But rather than a scientific toy or an adherence to a structural conformity of form and content, this prismatic apparatus, this simple mirrored sculpture placed in front of the camera's lens, transforms its subject into multiple versions of itself. The event of military occupation at this particular site has passed, and Munoz essentially captures the after image of the architecture that was left behind that traces the structural transformation of this place through time. Um, yeah, I have more to say, but we're just gonna finish with this and then we can do questions. Um, and where is it gone? There we go. Um, so this is really quiet, but what you're not here is it's just location itself. It's um, seven minutes long.
I mean, I had some more, but it's already 6.15, so maybe I'll leave it there. Unless you want me to go in here.